Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show. Uh, welcome to another edition of Forensics Talks. Um, today, I've just got a couple of quick announcements and then we're gonna get right into our next guest. And the first thing is the International Association of Bloodstain Pattern Analysts. So uh, they are having their uh, annual or their annual conference, which is virtual this year. Uh, it's just less than two weeks away on November 16th, but uh, please uh, go ahead if you're interested, you know, go to their website and uh, you can uh, join in there. Also on November 23rd, you're gonna be having that cloud compare course. Uh, yeah, cloud compare course. So if you're interested in 3D, if you're doing photogrammetry, laser scanning, structured light scanning, all that sort of thing, and you wanna learn about manipulating uh, data, 3D data and that sort of thing, cloud compare is a really amazing uh, piece of software uh, that you can get for free, which is even better. And I'll be covering a whole bunch of different things there. All right, let me uh, get right into our guest here. Um, first thing, uh, this is uh, Dr. James Goodrich, and uh, he has been a, uh, an odontologist uh, since 1996. He graduated with a Bachelor of Dental Surgery from the University of Otago. In 2012, he was a fellow of the faculty, faculty of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology at the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia. And most recently, he's uh, gotten a certificate in global mental health Health, and that's something that I'm going to be talking and asking him about as well. He's had a private practice as a dental surgeon since 1996, and his main interests are forensic odontology. And so uh, he's been called upon before to uh, provide opinions about identification for deceased individuals, uh, age estimation, uh, uh, bite marks, and uh, you know he serves as an expert witness. All of that, of which I which I want to ask him about, including some of the. Um, uh, situations that he's worked in, including the disaster victim identification for the Canterbury earthquake in 2011, the Christchurch mosque shootings, and the Wakari White Island volcano eruption. And he has a, a very extensive CV, and I'm not going to continue because I'll be here all day. So I'll just invite him in. So, hey, Jim, how you doing? Good morning, Eugene. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. You can join us. You're on the other side of the world, but it's actually Friday morning, your time. So it's uh, it's an early morning for you there. So I appreciate it. Um, I think the first thing that I wanted to just ask you about is how you got started with dentistry and what, what was it that piqued your interest about the, the this particular area? Yeah, uh, I, I, it's a it's a long and, and not particularly uh, interesting story. Uh, I was always going to be a, a, a doctor. I was always going to be a surgeon. Um, and my uncle, who was exactly that, um, uh, over a few years of talking to me about it, essentially put me off. Um, he was struggling with his lifestyle. He was struggling with balance and things. And, um, you know, at 17, 18, 19, I, I really had to listen to somebody who'd been doing that for 20 something odd years. And um, uh, I asked around and my dentist was really the only healthcare professional that that said that he would have done it again. Um, oh, really? He had a little bit of time off and he wasn't on call and it sounded good. Um, I've always wanted to do things with my hands. I was always enjoyed puzzles and fixing stuff, you know. Um, yeah. And so that's that's really how I, I got into it. And um, I didn't avoid the, the on call. I didn't avoid the the problems with lifestyle <laughs> balance. But but here we yeah. are. Yeah, for sure. And then when did you migrate over to the forensic odontology part? So the the very first time I was exposed to uh, anything to do with forensic odontology was a, a lecture that I had, and I think it was my final year of dental school. Um, uh, the great Professor Jules Kaiser was a, 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 a relatively new. Uh, addition to the staff at the University of Otago School of Dentistry at that stage, and um, he's a, a he was a giant. He's recently passed away, sadly, but he was, he is a giant in the field, and uh, he he freely spoke to us about some of his experiences on on large scale disaster victim identifications, and I, I was fascinated by it. Um, after that, upon graduation, I, I actually worked in a in a large base hospital here. And one of you know, one morning, um, they asked for some dentists to come and help with a, a, an identification of a, a car crash that the, the individuals had had passed away, and and they were severely burned, um, so they required a dental identification. And somehow we bimbled through it. Um, I, I shudder to think of the quality of the, the reporting and things at that stage. But um, after that, I. I was determined to know a little bit more about it and and, and become competent, um, and and since then I've uh, I've been very very fortunate to be mentored by some very 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 uh, good people in the field who are very generous with their time, 
Um, a little shout out to Zaf Khoury there. Um, yeah. he's, he's the best in the business. And um, <laughs> I've worked with him for 20 years now. All right, excellent. I've been very fortunate. So um, I, wanted to, I want to ask you about teeth because we're going to be talking about dentition and teeth and you guys work with mouths and teeth a lot. So um, what is it about the teeth that makes them so resilient? And so I had a little graphic here I was looking. And so, I mean, they're hard. They're, they're probably, are they, I'm assuming they're the hardest substance that the body makes. Is that true? Well, the enamel certainly is. Um, as you can see there, there are multiple uh, tissue structures associated with a tooth and the the, uh, the topmost structure there is the enamel. And I'm told that's actually the hardest uh, material produced in the animal kingdom is uh, human dental enamel. Um, it's resistant to abrasion, it's resistant to, to breakage, but it's also resistant to, to high temperatures. Um, it doesn't, I mean, we, we see teeth out of two, three, four thousand year old graves that are, you know, as good as they had been there for six months. Um, yeah. And there, it's their substantivity, it's their durability that, that gives us an advantage oftentimes if, if we're looking at, uh, you know, very decomposed remains or, or remains that have been subject to, to thermal forces. Um, you know, they, they tend to stick around. Yeah. Yeah. So, so fire and, and all those things. Yeah. And imagine even things like acid and stuff, it, it, you really got to, yeah. It's yeah. Pretty, you've got to have a sustained exposure to, to, to acid, to, to destroy a tooth. Break you know, it down. Contrary really. to popular belief, a, yeah, a, yeah. a glass of Coca-Cola won't do the trick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's not what my mom used to tell me. So I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of nomenclature now I've, I've and again, I, I got it. Full disclosure, I am I have very little dentistry experience or whatever, but it is it is somewhat interesting to me. Um, but I you know, I remember my my dentist talking about one one, you know, two one or naming the different teeth. And so going back and doing a little bit of nomenclature, uh, or checking into the nomenclature, I can see there's actually different charts that are used. So there is there a one standard that's used, or is it depending where you are? It depends where you are. Um, in New Zealand, we use FDI. In Canada, you use F FDI, and that was the the uh, nomenclature you were talking about there. Um, tooth one one, tooth two one. Um, if you're in the US, they use the universal system. Um, they're the only people that use the universal system, um, so that would be tooth eight and nine. Um, there are variations around the world. There are uh, evolutions over time. Um, certain militaries use different uh, different systems as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've been exposed to the uh, the U.S. Navy system, um, which is the universal system, but the lower jaw is flipped. Um, so you can imagine, but with the different systems using similar numbers and similar sounding uh, terms for teeth, there is definitely room for confusion, um, and that's one of the genuine issues when we're when we're working internationally with with folks from different parts of the world. We need to speak the same language with teeth. Um, yeah, uh, don't, yeah, I can imagine how that can get very confusing. Uh, even uh, mis you know, mis miscounting one tooth uh, probably wouldn't be all that difficult to do. Um, 100%. So forensic odontology, um, with respect to the kinds of activities that you work on, uh, human identification is probably the largest one. And, um, you know, people that are in the field probably know that, but a lot of people, for example, bite mark analysis often gets a lot more exposure or whatever. So um, what can you tell me about the activities that are done by a forensic odontologist? Right. So you're right. Our, our for want of a better term, bread and butter would be individual human identification. You know, we, the uh, police or coronial services require us to, to aid them in an identification for a, usually a believed to be individual. Um, and for whatever reason, they're not reliably uh, visually identifiable. And I've, I've got some pretty strong thoughts around that as well, as you know. Um, but they'll, they'll call us and we'll, we'll turn up and we'll examine the remain, the human remains, we'll examine the deceased and gain all the evidence we can um, in that, in that in clinical environment. And then we will compare that to the anti-mortem records, the records that are, are from the believed to be individual that have been produced as a product of their, uh, their dental experience over time. Uh, hopefully there are radiographs, hopefully there are uh, photographs, um, but sometimes it's just a chart that we're managing. Um, and then we reconcile the, the two pieces of evidence and, and determine whether we have confidence that they're from one and the same individual or not. Um, as far as bite marks go, yeah, yeah. Uh, famously, there's been some some problems with bite marks, um, mm -hmm. and uh, there's there's lots of good reasons why there's problems with bite marks as well. Um, and if you've got an hour on that, I'm happy to speak to yeah, you about well, that for yeah, an hour well, as well. <laughs> we'll see. We we've got an hour for everything, and there's there's a lot of questions to have, but I, yeah. I think we'll, we'll we'll touch on it. We'll touch on the bite mark stuff in a little bit. Um, 
but one of the uh, in terms of the process of the, the identification. So, I mean, there's uh, anti-mortem, post-mortem and, and uh, you know, looking at records and that sort of thing. Um, but could you could you sort of walk me through, you know, what it, how, for example, maybe it's happened with you before in, in some of the cases that you've worked on where, you know, you're approached by somebody to come and assist and then what the, the typical process might be? OK, so uh, we work in New Zealand, we work in, in teams. And we work in regions. Um, working in teams is is relatively unusual worldwide. Uh, the minimum unit of odontology in New Zealand is two odontologists. Um, so we don't do anything uh, by ourselves, and and that's uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. And and one of them is that if you're working by yourself, it's very easy to to start on a premise that's that's false and then continue to, to, to jackpot that mistake. Um, and if you're working as a team, it's very, very easy for someone else, another pair of eyes just to say, hey, you know, I think that's that's upside down, or maybe that's backwards, or or maybe that isn't that tooth, or maybe you're looking at a different, and you can talk about it and, and, and reconcile that a, 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 as you go. So I just like to emphasize that the team approach here, and it's it's critical to, to not only uh, um, any success that we might have, but also to, to Frankly, my enjoyment of the uh, of the process, you know, working in small teams um, aids not only your, your 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 ability, your efficiency, but also your your mental health in many ways. Um, so uh, I'll get a get a call from from the organisers, and I'll be asked to attend a a, a post mortem examination. Typically, we have a few hours notice. Uh, sometimes it's the next day. Sometimes it's that day um, that we're required. Um, occasionally we're required to recover remains from a scene, uh, but that is, it's, it's less standard. Um, so we'll present to the mortuary. Um, the police uh, will have uh, done their property uh, part of it by then. Depending on the nature of the remains, the, the medical post-mortem may or may not have been carried out. Um, and we, we work with the pathology teams to to fit in with them as much as we can. Um, they have the, the priority, of course, in a, in a suspicious death uh, situation. Um, and, and exactly as, as I said earlier on, we'll take a, a full mouth set of x-rays, full mouth set of radiographs, a uh, full mouth set of uh, photographs. Uh, we specifically photograph any restoration or abnormality or uh, something that might be slightly distinctive or unusual. Um, we do a full mouth charting just as though we were doing that for a, a new patient in a dental surgery. Um, very detailed. We, we generally get one shot at this examination, so we want to make sure we get all of the information we can. Um, we document all of that. Uh, th these days, that's that's largely digital. And uh, once we've once we've got that information, we uh, will then compare that to the anti-mortem information that that we've been gathering with the assistance of the police over that over that period of time. And uh, sometimes anti-mortem uh, information is is a little sparse. Uh, other times, it's it's very very good. And sometimes it, it turns up at different times. So that's uh, you know the. The old trap used to be that uh, you know if you only had a an X-ray of a of a single tooth, then that was you know to compare to, then that was the only X-ray you took in the mortuary. Mm. But yeah, but that's uh, that's something we we try and avoid these days. We do a full examination for every right. every individual. Sometimes there's a lot of reconstruction involved. You know, if we've got a deceased individual that's been uh, burned or or uh, sometimes we have uh, post mortem predation, um, pigs, what have you, uh, mm. or a, uh, sometimes uh, gunshot wounds require a lot of reconstruction of the remains before we can start the examination. Um, so it can be very, very time consuming. Uh, uh, probably the, the shortest examination would be maybe 90 minutes. No, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. We've certainly had cases that have lasted days. Who are the people that actually will go out and start? Because you, you got you have to recover all of the old records, right? Like somebody's got to go out. So who does who does that? And how? I mean, you call around. You you maybe you have some people that are missing. So you ask the families. Like what? How does that work? Yeah, there's meant to be a a, a, a very firm system in place, but oftentimes it's a little ad hoc. Mm. Uh, the police. Uh, have the main responsibility, but of course they don't necessarily have the contacts that we do. So if we find out who the dentist may have been um, from a family member, then sometimes we'll directly be in touch with them. Uh, but the New Zealand Dental Association has a uh, obviously access to all of our uh, contact details, and we'll get a, a, a blast email, um, you know, attention, you know, do you have records for this individual? And if so, please get in touch. Um, we, we need to be a little bit careful around that. You know, if, if we keep sending those out all over the country, you know, twice a week, there's going to be fatigue. We do want people to check their records properly. 
Um, so we we generally try and target the area that we think the, the bleed to be was from. Okay, uh, I have a the form police, up on this. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say. Sorry. That, um, I have a form up on the screen, and that was the. Uh, you talked about charting just before about making comparisons and I believe it's the, is it Interpol that keeps like sort of a standard form or something uh, or is it, or just people kind of adapt the form as they need. And I believe there's two, there's like a, uh, I believe that they just color them differently. They, you know, one is, one is pre and one is post. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. 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 Okay. I think so postmortem and yellows are antemortem and they look like perhaps that I can't really see them very well, but they look perhaps the older form. Um, the, the updated Interpol forms are, are now called the 600s for the dental aspect of it. And there are, uh, it's designed to be a, an all encompassing uh, set of fillable forms for an entire disaster victim identification team. So there'll be, uh, if you go earlier on in the piece, there's this property right through to uh, haircuts, uh, you know the the pathology, the fingerprints, you, you name it. Any team that is involved with it will have will have a form, and and we have a couple of forms in there. Uh, and you can see the the little wee squares in the middle there. That's the odontogram, um, mm -hmm. and would 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 fill those surfaces in, for example, to show where restorations were, crowns were, missing teeth, etc. Well, you mentioned also about things being digital. So I imagine you know photographs. Um, x-rays you may even have plaster casts i mean there may even be somebody may have had a cast um now that um a lot of dent my dentist uh, just a few years ago has a, a scanner in an in, in intraoral scanner 3d scanner right. um so all this data how like maintaining it storing it and i mean here you're having paper forms but is there a digital version of this that's being used yeah, yeah, those forms are on the Interpol website. There's a digital a version of those forms that are that are fillable. Um, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's 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 possible in the in the mortuary at the moment. We do we do prefer to have a, a paper version of that um, just next to us so that we can see what we're and you know crossing out as we go. But right, right, right. I, you know, I, I'm an old man now. I'm getting a little old fashioned about that kind of thing. But. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, I try yeah. to pull them off, and, and my, my my pages are like massively written with huge fonts now. Yeah, I, I understand you. Um, well, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about was um, you you obviously you look at the teeth, you make comparisons, but what else can you uh, you can find things like the teeth can tell you other things, right? Like so, for example, maybe um, can you determine like the race uh, or or um, uh gender or um things like that like can they tell you other things i, I could never determine someone's gender um from from teeth i i, I might be able to estimate their sex um but uh, it, uh, there really isn't a very good technique for, for sex estimation simply from teeth that doesn't involve dna um, there's research in the area at the moment um, there's been some uh, some glimmers of hope around believe it or not the thickness of the enamel layer on canines um, most techniques that I'm aware of at the moment are, are not much better than guess. Um, there's a lot of crossover between the sexes and the dentition. Um, the, the the cranium, the skull or itself, that's a, a little bit of a different story. And our, our uh, anthropology expert friends are very, very good at, at, at estimating uh, sex in those circumstances. But as far as teeth go, um, we're not particularly good at it. Uh, one of the things we can do from teeth though, um, and we can do this nearly in every phase of life now, is that we can apply radiographic techniques or other techniques and we can estimate age, um, age of death of that individual. And that that's that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, uh, Roberto Camerier, uh, around about 2004, he's an Italian researcher. He does a lot of, a lot of ongoing research um, in age, dental age estimation. And he was one of the first people to turn up with a uh, an adult age estimation technique that, that was applicable and, 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 and good enough to be used. Um, mm. And that can be really handy if we're if we're trying to disambiguate, if we don't have any records, but we have say a, a car accident where we know there's a 25 year old and a, and a 65 year old, we can we can we can nail that down, no problem at all, simply using those age estimation techniques. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, can you explain to me what is meant by uh, post-mortem dental profiling or like reconstructive dental identification? Are those terms that are used, is that just part of the, is, yeah. Yeah. Not. Not really. I mean, I. I think that that really is just putting the 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 picture together. After uh, yeah. Someone's okay. That's why. Yeah. Interesting. Um. So other things that. Well, let's let's talk about bite mark analysis. We have to cross that bridge anyway. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but, um, as you said before, uh, there have been a lot of cases, um, 
both good and bad, and, but unfortunately, the bad has often outweighed the good. And um, I remember talking to Dr. David Sweet from the University of, of British Columbia, and he sort of said it to me once, and it just it always stuck with me to this day. And that was, um, he said, you know, way back, uh, the forensic odontologists thought that they had it all figured out, and we we were thought we were doing really well and everything else, and then all of a sudden there were all these cases that started hitting especially with bite mark analysis where it was like, oh boy, you know, this is, this, there's been a, a grave miscarriage of justice here. And then it happened again and again over and over. So um, most of the forensic odontologists that I know today are probably the most, they're, they're their own worst critics when it comes to bite mark analysis. And oh, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think most of them are, most of the ones that I have uh, come across anyway. Um, but I, I know a lot of people brush it off, but I, I feel like, bite mark analysis has value. I feel like it, it still has a lot of strong value in many cases. Me and so, yeah, so what's, uh, yeah, so maybe uh, if you can give just... Well, I'll, I'll start there. by saying that, that, that Dr. David Sweet, it wouldn't, would probably be not only the nicest, but one of the most brilliant odontologists that I've ever met. Um, one of the loveliest men in the in, in the business. And uh, if, if he's if he's listening, hello, David. Um, look, bite marks, uh, I, I think the progression of the problem is that we are very, very good at uh, individual identification. We don't get that wrong. Um, when we're called to do that, if we give, if we have enough evidence to give an opinion, um, you, can, you can bank on it. It's a primary identifier. It's as, as far as individual identification goes, it's as good as fingerprints and it's as good as DNA if we have the evidence. And I'll, I'll argue that with anyone. Um, we, and I think there was a tendency to conflate our ability in one area of what we do, and remember that's the majority of what we do, with ability to do other aspects of what we're called to do. And, you know, it was um, probably the Ted Bundy case was the, the first very famous bite mark um, uh, prosecution or prosecution based largely on bite marks. And the people involved with that uh, became famous. Um, they became sought after as bite mark experts. And there's a there's a real tendency to wish to behave as that expert, if you see what I mean, and to be as useful as you can. Um, and over time, unfortunately, practitioners uh, drew conclusions from uh, patent injuries and for comparison between those uh, patent injuries and the dentitions of suspected biters. They, they drew conclusions that just weren't scientifically supportable. Um, the issue really can be divided into, into, into two categories. Number one, human dentition is pretty much the same pe pe person to person. I mean, at a, at a microscopic scale, we are unique, but largely everyone's got the similar sort well, of... Well, I, I want to ask you about that because mm -hmm. I, I think most people, and, and even myself, when you just sort of think about it, when you take the, the dentition on the whole, you would think that... It is unique. I mean, if you think about the 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 size, the distribution, the location, the rotation, the the position of all the different teeth relative to one another, I can't. Well, I shouldn't say I can't. I couldn't. I can't imagine in in a population of billions of people there could be a couple of people that have similar teeth. But the fact that identical, I, I would have a very difficult time with that. But I guess I guess the question though is, are they are they similar enough that they would be difficult to distinguish? Right, right. And, uh, you know, if you give me a, a 3D scan of someone's mouth, then, yeah, I'll be able to disambiguate that individual with any other individual, almost certainly. Um, but we don't have a 3D scan. We've got a, a patent injury on a victim or a, or a suspected patent, uh, victim. It may or may not be a bite. Um, and the human skin is a very, very poor recording medium. It's a very poor impression material. And oftentimes we're not looking at an impression of the teeth on skin. We're looking at the, the wound reaction, the bruising, the tissue reaction to that trauma. So there's a disconnect there as well. Yeah. Um, human skin, human tissues, they, they move, they distort, they bend. Um, it's a very poor recording medium. And, you know, we see people uh, who do research, wonderful research on, on the, the minutiae of the, the, the 3D uh, nature of the human dentition. Um, and if the other side of the equation is a is a really crappy impression on human skin, it doesn't matter how good your other techniques are. That's right. going to be your accuracy limiting factor. Yeah, um, that makes that makes total sense. If the quality yeah. of evidence that you're given is crappy, then you know it's right. very difficult to make a good right. comparison. No, that makes a so, lot of sense. 
So bite marks in things like, say, cheese, um, excellent. Chocolate, excellent. Uh, there are other recording media that, that we can have very high degree of confidence with, but human skin is where we fall down. Human dentition is another one. Um, at the moment, we're working up a, a dog bite case, um, and the, the premise of that is that there's a, a closed population. Um, these dogs are quite different. Um, dogs' teeth, they puncture. So we do have more accurate impressions if you like of where the the, the teeth were mm -hmm. um, and that increases our confidence so i agree with you i think bite mark analysis and bite mark work has its value um, but we need to not say any more than what we know yeah you know? very interesting um, um and inter I, uh, sorry yeah, no, I, I was just going to say well like you were saying it, it is very good in fact uh, i believe uh, in in the world or in, in interpol at least says dna latent prints and bite marks. Those three things are reliable sources of that you can use for identification. In fact, probably the only three. No, I'll, I'll correct you there. Um, DNA, right. uh, fingerprints and, and odontology. Not what did I say? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, using bite marks, right. Excuse so, me. I was but yeah, you're right. You're right. That, it, it, is a, it is a primary identifier. Um, the, with, with bite marks, you know, the, the problem we've got is that uh, people who were successful without knowing that they were wrong, if you know what I mean, continued to to claim that expertise and continued to be able to do things that no other no other people could. Um, whenever I've got a bite mark analysis or a bite mark comparison, if if you can't see what I'm trying to show you that is obvious, then it's not there. You know, it, we don't have special eyes. It either it either fits or it doesn't. You know, um, and when you've got people saying, "Look," Trust me, I know I've been doing this for 25 years and I, I, I can see this. Um, that's, that's simply not true um, in a lot of cases. And Ian Pretty and uh, Adam Freeman uh, shook things up a, a, a couple of years ago, uh, maybe three years ago now, four years ago, um, with a study that, that showed that as odontologists, oftentimes we don't even agree uh, what a patent injury is. Is it a human bite? Is it not a human bite? Uh, there were some controversies around the study design and things but I, I think the point it was well made that you know if we can't agree then is there science there uh, yeah you know and once again it comes down to the the spectrum of evidential value of a patent injury right from a, a diffuse bruise right through to a a, a, a beautiful impression of a, a full arch of teeth opposed against another full arch of teeth with nice variations and and you know missing teeth and distinctive features you know and the problem is we generally get evidence on the on the, the former side of that scale yeah, yeah. interesting well i want to ask you um uh, we're doing pretty good for time, but I want to ask you about some of the cases you worked on. Then I want to ask you about some of the areas of interest that you have. And uh, and before I forget, Dr. David Sweet sent me this a while back. Um, <laughs> so nice. he was very kind. He sent me some. This is a long time ago, but yeah, uh, David, if you're listening, still, thank you very much. Um, I still have nightmares about that thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, did you? A uh, side note, but you, you got me thinking about it now. There was somebody, in, I thought it was in Texas, that they were doing some research on bite mark, and they created this. It's like a hydraulic machine. And right. the, the poor participants had to stick their arm in this machine and this thing would clamp down on them. And every yeah. curse word you could imagine would, would come out, right. of, right. out of this, right. this thing. It was hilarious. Yeah. But um, a good friend of mine, Mark Eilers, was involved with that. Um, oh, was he? Okay. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a nice guy, brilliant man. And uh, he uh, he would have taken a great deal of pleasure in, <laughs> in yeah. not only biting people with that, but being bitten by it himself, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Interesting. Well, let me ask you about cases. So um, let's talk about the, the, the Canterbury earthquake in uh, 2011 and that was uh, Tuesday 22nd of February 2011 it was a magnitude 6.3 earthquake uh, that caused uh, a lot of damage and and uh, uh, death in Christchurch and uh, and Littleton yeah um, right. I believe I'm not exactly sure but it was something like on the order of 185 people that were killed and I think there were a lot of people that were injured as well maybe thousands um, what can you tell us about your work there Okay, so um, 6.3 doesn't sound like a big earthquake, um, but it was an aftershock from from several months of, uh, of of primary shocks and then aftershocks. They Christchurch suffered hundreds of aftershocks during that that time. In fact, they had another earthquake there this morning, another 4.5 there this morning. And while 6.3 doesn't sound a lot, um, Christchurch is based on 
um, a, a single substrate with with mud and things, and it was the uh, the ground acceleration uh, was the issue, and it was one of the the fastest ground accelerations that had been recorded. So it was a, a not a very heavy job, but it was a fast job, and unfortunately, um, things may well have been weakened by prior uh, prior shocks. Uh, and if that, on the twenty second of February, we lost uh, a, a lot of building facades, brick buildings. Christchurch was a an older town in the scheme of things in New Zealand, um, and it was the 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 loss of facades of brick buildings, but also uh, one or two buildings caught fire um, and people were, were were trapped and and unfortunately, as you say, we we had 185 deceased. Um, so that was a a major disaster victim identification response for us. Um, the determination from the powers that be was made early uh, that if 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 countries had deceased on the ground, then they would be allowed to assist with the disaster victim identification. Um, the scene phase was a very much an uh, international uh, effort with the, the Japanese uh, heavy lift team turned up early. They were fully self-sufficient um, and they, they worked hard, uh, did, did amazing, amazingly heroic, dangerous work. Um, and sadly, uh, when we'd finished our disaster victim identification response, that Japanese team was sent straight to Fukushima, which happened um, a couple of days after, after we, we were wrapped up. Um, so the scene phase, the body recovery, um, there were uh, countless uh, displays of heroism by the, the police, the uh, search and rescue, uh, the military, overseas groups, and, and, and people were recovered. And as and when they were recovered, they were plugged into the disaster victim identification uh, next phase, which is the, the post-mortem phase. So they were uh, relocated out to Burnham Military Camp, which is maybe 20 kilometres outside Christchurch. Um, and one of the very large buildings out there was prepared as a, as a, as a field mortuary. Um, so the individuals would, would come through in their body bags. The police would, would manage the property aspect of it, um, any circumstantial evidence, wallets, name badges, uh, hearing aids, etc. cetera. Um, and then they would, would cycle through the, the different teams, the different teams, DNA, um, pathology, uh, fingerprints and, and odontology and by the time they reached the end of that process all of that information would be collated and reconciled by a separate team again with the anti-mortem records that were uh, being found uh, from all over the world um, and uh, it's a it's a it's a lot of work um, so I think at one stage there we had four odontology teams working simultaneously and we were doing 16 18 hours a day um, you know it's a it's a highly motivated environment. You know, you want to get it right and you want to get it done. And there's a lot of, usually a lot of political pressure to do things quickly. Um, mm -hmm. People want their loved ones back and politicians sometimes make promises that are a little unrealistic. Um, and that pressure always comes back to, to the police and to the DVI teams. Um, of course, it's a very regulated environment. There's, there's things you cannot do in a mortuary. There's things that you can't uh, do or say. You know, you certainly shouldn't be, uh, for example, taking your own photographs or anything, you know, appalling like that. Um, mm. And uh, having said that, though, it's um, it, it sounds a little macabre, but it's it's one of the most satisfying things that I professionally had anything to do with. Uh, you do very definitely feel like you've helped. Yeah, no, I can imagine. And how long how long were you there for in total? I was there nine days. Oh, that is, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I I missed the start of it, um, and then came through on that that second rotation. Um, I was a very junior odontologist at that stage. Yeah. Okay. You were also involved in the Christchurch, uh, the mosque, the two mosques that were uh, were attacked, and that was on in March 2019. Uh, there were two consecutive shootings. Um, uh, I, I'm not even going to mention the guy's name, but uh, what what can you tell me about the the mosque shootings? Well, the the terrorist attack in Christchurch really shook New Zealand, um, and the terrorist himself, he said that he came to Christchurch to show people that nowhere on earth was safe from from their ideology. So he deliberately targeted a, a peaceful community, and Christchurch is my hometown, right? So I, I seem to have to go home and and help out with these tragedies that that happen. Um, the difference really between the mosque shootings and any other DVI that I've had anything to do with was that um, this was a crime investigation. This was a, a, a terrorist attack. Um, it was seen as um, dozens of different murders, if you see what I mean. So there was a, 
a, a different slant to the forensic aspect of it. Um, it you know, th these were not suspicious deaths, but they were essentially murder investigations at every stage of the post-mortem as well. So there was a, a, a different sort of slant on the, particularly the pathology side of things. And um, that's, you know, that uh, from an odontology point of view, it was relatively straightforward. Um, we had facial disruption, there was reconstruction that, that we had to do, but these people were, you know, largely very intact and the evidence was was readily available, um, which is, is sometimes the challenge in a DVI. You know, mm -hmm. if you're looking at a, an airframe crash, um, sometimes you're unfortunately sifting through rubble to, to find tiny bits and pieces to put back together. Um, so the odontology phase of the, the, the mosque shootings was was straightforward and, and as a result I think we did it very very quickly and efficiently. The uh, the police uh, have very good fingerprint teams here as, the, as they do in Canada and um, they because their fingerprint teams are sworn police I think they have an increased uh, propensity to want to do the identifications in-house if you see what I mean with their mm -hmm. teams. So the only other difference really was with the mosque shootings that the fingerprint teams took took temporal precedence over us they had they had had first access to the deceased um, but that's that's just a a, a, a logistical yeah no well work. i remember i remember when it happened and i mean it wasn't uh it, it's one of those tragedies that when they happen it doesn't just affect the country but it, it's a, sort of has a global impact and that that was definitely one of them for sure um right. The last one I wanted to ask you about, or maybe not, maybe the second last one, we'll see, but uh, the Wakari um, White Island Volcano, uh, that was a volcano that erupted uh, on the in 9th of December 2019. And uh, it's, I guess it's a, it's a tourist location where people go and, and visit and uh, people knew that it is an active volcano, right? Yeah. Right. And, okay. And so, um, yeah, it just, it happened, uh, I think it was about just after 2 p.m., on the ninth, and it just went off. And unfortunately, there were people on the island when it did. Um, what uh, what can you tell me about that particular one? Well, I have to be a, a little careful about discussion of Fakari White Island. It's still uh, the subject of an active workplace um, uh, workplace safety or work safe investigation, a little bit like your OSHA. Um, so there are things I, I can't say, but uh one of the the real lessons learned from that was that these these individuals who uh were killed on the island um were unfortunately uh contaminated by with a variety of different substances um, uh, sulfuric acids um, cyanide compounds etc so the our uh, fire and safety hazmat teams um, Turned up very early on in the piece. They had seen primacy, and they were they were in charge, and they stopped the whole show uh, after detecting these um, these volatile and, and toxic compounds on these individuals. So that was another complicating factor. They had to be decontaminated prior to the, the disaster victim identification uh, process. And what I will say is that the recovery of uh, uh, of the deceased on that island is, is some of the bravest stories that i've ever heard um just extraordinary yeah um, it's very easy for us we're just sitting back another 200 miles or so from the from the scene but you know these people were turning up and i was i was blown away with the efforts that people had made on the ground to get these people off yeah for sure um and you know another another um i'll call it a case but another uh, another one that you worked on was the uh uh on the gilbert islands the battle of tarawa uh, and that you know and that was the uh I guess that was a World War II battle that was fought, fought uh, November 19th, 1943 in the uh, Pacific. And you're helping with um, identification and repatriation, yeah? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, was, and, and that was a real honor. It, it was a case of just being, uh, you know, on the right spot at the right time and being available. Um, uh, my, my good friend's Corinne Danjou, who's a, a Quebecois a dentist and forensic odontologist extraordinaire, and uh, Dr. David Sen, who, uh, you know, literally wrote the wrote the book on forensic odontology. Um, they were engaged by a, a, a private entity by the name of uh, a History Fly, uh, which is founded and run by Mr. Mark Noah, and they have a, a stated mission to uh, find, recover, identify, and repatriate uh, any service personnel from 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 US 
combat history. So one of the theatres is Pacific Theatre, um, as you say, in, 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 in Kiribati. They also work in Europe, uh, other countries in Asia, and they do wonderful work. They have uh, teams of historians who look at records where, for example, planes may have gone down or, or battles may have occurred, um, and they will look at uh, modern satellite photography. They have geophysics teams. They have uh, anthropologists, pathologists, um, archaeologists, and, and, and one or two odontologists as well. And um, it was just, just very, very uh, humbling to be part of that um, as, a, as a Kiwi. Um, you know, we had we had coast watches that were killed by the Japanese on that island. Um, so there was a there was a tie up with with New Zealand and the the, the Marine Division that that uh, hit and took Tarawa um, had just been furloughed in New Zealand. So they were the they were the guys that we had experience of, and they married all our women after the uh, after the mm -hmm. war. And it was just an honour to be part of that. You know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's, I, I wanted to cover those because they, they are quite different. I mean, there's two that which are disasters and, you know, one is sort of an attack and, you know, one is, uh, you know, repatriating, uh, you know, from an, a very historical event. Um, mm -hmm. But in the case of where you're working with um, disaster victims or even the attack victims, um, well, I I'm, I'm, I'm was going to ask, you know, dentists, most dentists are dentists first. And, you know, then they get subjected to and exposed to some of these really uh, awful situations. So um, I want to ask you about mental health and the state of some of these people after working like that. You know, if you're if you're a pathologist and, uh, you know, and you're doing this sort of every day or whatever, not to say that it can't affect you, it, it certainly can. But I, I think it might be worse when, you know, you, you are not exposed to it on a regular basis. And then all of a sudden you're hit with a, a massive disaster. And what can that do to somebody? Yeah, I, I agree. It's a it's a particular area of concern of mine. I think our our mental health support uh, perhaps has been a little lacking in the past as well. And you know, much like uh, Canadian folks, uh, Kiwis, we're we're programmed just to get on with things, and we you know mustn't grumble. Um, you know, just just suck it up and and turn up the next day. And we've got to do better than that. You know, I we lose colleagues to to burnout uh, in the forensic field. Um, and sometimes worse. Um, and uh, you know, there are little things that we can do to to decompress this. And the the, the team approach that we take on a day to day basis here helps a lot. Um, I'm I'm very fortunate to work with friends rather than colleagues, um, so we can discuss these things. But um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we are not prepared for it. We're not trained for it. Um, and oftentimes we're not supported. And after a a, a large scale disaster event identification, we do have some access to uh, police funded um, psychological support but it's 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 not enough um, and and I think we need to to really address that and, and understand that it it is a problem and I think once we've done that we can we can perhaps move forward a little bit yeah. well you and you actually I, I mean you did uh, the the some of the studies you did at the Harvard Medical School on the uh, certificate in global mental health um, was was that because of exactly what we're talking about or is, is you looking to is it like a support system you're help you know wanting to help other other odontologists as well yeah well i i, I felt i needed to legitimize uh, myself a little bit by getting uh, some training in that area before i started you know really really trying to push for for change around here um you know it's interesting that you, you mentioned that that some people are, are okay in those environments because they see it all the time. Uh, I, I just remember that when we were in Christchurch for the earthquake, uh, the police embedded uh, psychologists in the mortuary with us. So they were walking around asking us how we were doing. Um, I don't think they lasted a full day um, because they, they were, unfortunately, they were the ones that were really out of their, out of their <laughs> comfort zone. So, yeah, yeah right. I'm not surprised. Um, so there's this, sometimes there's this disconnect between management trying to do the right thing and, and, and the right thing being done. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to get a little bit more uh, understanding of, of resilience of recovery. Um, it's one thing being exposed to vicarious trauma, and it's one thing being traumatized. But we need to to work out how we can manage that and and move on and still be functional and um, and, and still contribute. Um, and and resilience is a is a funny thing, and that that recovery aspect of it. Um, can be 
can be helped, it can be managed, it can be nurtured, and we shouldn't be relying on someone's, you know, someone the other day said something along the lines of, well, you, you know, you guys must be made of steel or something like that. And I said, well, you know, um, that's, that's the attitude that gets us in trouble. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we've got to recognise that we're we're human, and um, when we when we see a, a one day old baby deceased, or we see fifty people at once deceased, or we see someone that looks like your mother, or someone that looks like your sister, um, that and then examine them in in the most uh, intimate way um, for for hours. Uh, sometimes surgical resection, sometimes some. Um, some quite invasive things. Um, that's we've got to recognise that 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 isn't normal. Mm -hmm. That isn't common, um, and we need to help each other. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, and I like I like what you said before about in New Zealand you're working in teams because, you know, if you're working solo, then all of a sudden you know there's there's no one to really watch you, and you're not really watching anybody else. And I can see a lot of awful things happening there. But at least. You know, if if somebody's having a difficult day, then you know at least they have colleagues, they have friends that they can lean on and, and assist, and say, hey, you know, um, they could they can help each other out basically. So that, that that's a really right. good point. Um, you have another area of interest which has to do with uh, threshold age for children, for example, or immigrants, and um, it's a it's a big deal. Uh, in in uh, just a few weeks ago, I, I spoke with a forensic anthropologist and. Um, she does a lot of work because she's in Arizona. And so there's a lot of uh, Mexican families, you know, children and adults that cross over illegally. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, they don't always make it. And uh, so they need to be identified. Um, what can you tell me about your, your work and your interest in this area? Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about living individuals now. I'm talking once again about the dental age estimation. Mm -hmm or in fact, overall age estimation of these un undocumented migrants. And as you as you said, you know, uh, the world is currently suffering from its largest ever tragedy, the diaspora of, I think, 95 odd million um, displaced individuals, a, a goodly percentage of, of, of whom do not have documentation. Um, and when they reach a border, governments, in the way governments do, want to determine exactly who this individual is and how they can treat them under their law. And so one of the aspects that, that's uh, very topical is the age estimation with respect to thresholding somebody being a child versus being an adult. And it's uh, that, that hard birthday at 18 years old um, can be the difference between, uh, you know, one day is the difference between being regarded as a child and, and being regarded as a responsible adult. So in some jurisdictions, we're not... We're not thresholding uh, adulthood as much as we're thresholding criminality. And unfortunately, a lot of the techniques that we've had, and once again, this comes back, I think, uh, you know, the, the dentist wants to help. We're very, very good at identif identification. So we we conflate our ability at that with another with another field. And uh, so our dental estimation techniques have traditionally been um, some of the best age estimation techniques that are available to us. Um, but they're not sure fire. Uh, there are newer MRI multifactorial studies that are, are very, very good at thresholding individuals uh, at, above or below 18 years of age. Um, and we're getting as good as 92, 93 um, percent. But still, that's, you know, seven or eight percent of individuals, even with our very best, very expensive, very modern technique that are going to be um, misidentified or, or wrongly classified um, as as, a, as an adult. And that Unfortunately, if we're talking about threshold and criminality, that is not reasonable doubt. Um, and I think as a, as a group, we need to not only work to educate the policy makers and the, the decision makers, the triers of fact around, around the limitations of what we're doing, um, but also be very careful of how we report and who we report to. Um, you know, there are cases where uh, governments around the world have policies that they will take uh, an age estimation, say, from a dentist and another one from a, 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 a social method or, and then, you know, combine that approach to come up with a, a, a more informed decision. And then we find that that didn't actually happen, that it was only the dental report that was, was taken because the dentist said that that individual was, you know, 18, and, 18 years and two months with a, a standard deviation or a standard error of estimate of two years. Well, they said they're 18 years and two months, and that's what goes up, you know. Yeah. Um, and I just don't want to be part of something really that where my name is used uh, 
essentially to enforce a breach of human rights. And I, I think that conversation has started and and, and I, I, I have some, some wonderful colleagues in, in, in North America who, who have given a lot of feedback and are part of that conversation as well. And I, I think internationally there's now change in that area. Well, change, change should be coming. Interesting. Well, and maybe, you know, my, my, I wanted actually this to lead into, and maybe this is a good segue into research in areas that need to be developed. And I don't know if there are people currently working on this problem. Uh, I, I imagine they are. That sounds like an important, uh, uh, a body of work to be, to, to be researching. Um, what, what areas do you see right now, um, are, let's say, for example, high priority research areas in forensic odontology? Yeah, well, we've got the the human identification stuff pretty much pretty much down. You know, there are there are tweaks, there are improvements, there are techniques that we can use. Um, but you're right; it's uh, I, I review for for a couple of journals, and the the papers we're getting now are are focused on things like, um, for example, uh, lip prints, uh, tongue prints, uh, sex estimation from dentitions, but age estimation of bite marks really are the are the the, the areas that that we are getting um, a lot of research. A bite marks should be a greater priority for me. Um, there's a, a real danger there that we lose any genuine uh, evidence that, that that we can present from bite marks simply because it's been stamped overall as junk science and shouldn't be admissible. I think that's uh, that's a shame, um, particularly when we're using bite marks to exonerate somebody. Um, and if if I had been accused of biting somebody um, and I didn't have any teeth, um, I would like uh, a bite mark expert to, to advocate for me and say that it, it couldn't have been me. Um, and I think that's a, that's a right that I, I, I'd like to reserve. Um, but we we really need to pin down a scientific basis for, for, for bites. And, you know, whether we redo the, uh, the studies that show we can't agree based on maybe a team approach, you know, maybe maybe the, the, the Kiwi approach would, would, would have avoided a couple of these, these uh, individualizations that shouldn't have occurred just by somebody being in a room with somebody else saying really mm -hmm. yeah that's, say a, that? yeah, that's yeah. a really good idea um that's, that's interesting i i have some so for a long time i so i do a lot of work in the 3d realm so i really i, I enjoy doing these things and the fact that it the fact that bite mark has been given um sort of a, a bad rap to me means that that is an area that needs to be focus on that. Exactly. That's something, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, you know, DNA has been, you know, it's the Holy grail, whatever. I mean, I'm sure there's other areas in DNA that are going to be studied and that sort of thing, but it's always going to be the more difficult things that need to be researched. And, uh, and, and by yeah. the way, DNA, that's, that's the first thing we want to get out of a bite or a patent injury, right? That's the right. very, we, David Sweet, uh, his, his double swab technique. Um, that's the very fit. We want that biological information because we know that's going to be much, much, much more useful to us if we can, if we can get DNA from a, a suspected biter in a bite. That's that's oftentimes hard to explain otherwise. Um, so that's that. Yeah, absolutely, we we're aware of. Hopefully, hopefully, as a as a group of people now, we're aware of the limitations of biomark work. Um, I do see some. I, I do go to conferences around the world, and there are still some countries that are. Uh, uh, haven't quite got that far yet, but they're mm -hmm. still happy to, to individualize a, a, a suspect on the basis of a partial bite mark or a, or a bite mark at all. Um, but most most modern uh, odontology societies or organizations, um, it, that's essentially not not a uh, a conclusion we can draw anymore. You know? yeah. um, that's that's just not a sanctioned result. There must be like. There, may, they, there must be simple things that, you know, software or I, I'm thinking like a phone app. There's probably a phone app for a forensic odontologist somewhere. I don't know. But are, are there what, what kind of things have come along in the past, you know, five, 10 years that you've seen in terms of technology? Well, yeah, I mean, the uh, selfies are, are a big deal. You know, um, you've got people taking photographs of themselves uh, these days. Very excellent resolution just with a. Uh, you know, your average cell phone. Um, so we've got, that just plugs into more anti-mortem data. You know, we can compare uh, selfie photographs that, that contain teeth to, to post-mortem photographs. And, you know, we can do those overlays in Photoshop and fade them in and out and, and get a, hopefully a, a, a confident identification, sometimes based on that alone. 
um, if, if their dentition is distinctive enough and we have good enough uh, anti-mortem photography. So, you know, there's a there's a, a raft more anti-mortem material available to us these days than, than was available even 20 years ago, you know. Um, apart from that, uh, uh, you know, dentists are better at keeping records than we ever used to be um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but if we don't have good anti-mortem evidence, if we don't have anything to compare to, it doesn't matter how good our post-mortem skills are, uh, we you know we're, we're in trouble so yeah yeah um, you're right there's i mean orthodontic scans orthodontic models uh, selfies y y y you name it um, and we're, we're getting that now with the disaster victim identification teams as well we're getting selfie photographs coming through uh into the anti-mortem theater so so take yeah. take more selfie folks take more selfies and just in case smile. something happens smile, smile. <laughs> right make sure you smile <laughs> what uh what is next for you? I mean, what, what kind of things do you have on the go? Or are there any areas that you're looking to pursue deeper or new things? Um, what's, what's on the books for uh, Dr. Goodrich? Well, my ambition, Eugene, is always uh, simply to be reliable. Um, I, 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 I want to be regarded as someone who uh, turns up and does the job and can give an opinion that you can, you can trust. And whether if that opinion is... Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, then, th then that's good enough. Um, so I just want to keep working. Uh, I want to keep. I, I'm not a. I'm not a big researcher, as you know. I, I'm a, a functionary. Um, I, I'm. I'm hands on. Um, and uh, I, I think to answer your question, rather than dancing around it, my next. My next thrust really has to be to do with mental health support for forensic odontologists in New Zealand. Um, and I'll, I've just started putting feelers out with the society and the, the powers that be around that. And um, we need expert help and we need funding uh, because people don't self-fund this kind of thing um, until it's way too late. Um, and the, the, the big problem is that everyone's just fine until they're not. And yeah. we need to preempt that, right? Yeah, that's very true. Well, I'll tell you what, um, that's, it's been a very, uh, a, a great, great input. Uh, some things I wasn't expecting, which is fantastic. Um, I, if you can, please hang back for a second because I have some ideas that I want to bounce off you before you go. <laughs> so, and it has to do with the whole bite mark thing and it's probably a, a good time to, to, to bounce off you. But look, I want to say thank you so much for your time. Um, great input uh you know really appreciate you taking some time on your on your friday morning uh to to spend with us and yeah all i can say is uh, it's it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much that's a joy to talk to you eugene thank you thank you all right cheers all right everybody well that uh closes out this particular episode and uh next week we're going to have dr bill lewinsky and we're going to be talking about uh, human factors in uh, police encounters with, um, uh, with, with the public. And of course, there's a lot of controversy over uh, some of the re more recent things that have happened uh, in, in the US and abroad. And so uh, make sure you're there for that Thursday at 2 p.m. Don't forget also the Cloud Compare course is coming on November 23rd and also the IABPA conference that is going to be on November 16th to 20th. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.